So why, why did the zombie go to the Unitarian Universalist Church? <laughs> Brains. <laughs> Good morning and welcome to the Community Church of Chapel Hill Unitarian Universalist. Good morning and welcome to a most unusual worship service. As we draw towards the end of October, as we draw closer to Halloween, draw closer to those holy days known as All Souls Day and All Saints Day, I thought we might get into the spirit of this season and spend our worship service together this morning talking about zombies. And you may turn to me and ask, Reverend Tom, are you serious? And I would say, of course I'm not serious. Being serious is actually counterproductive when it comes to growing our souls and expanding our spirits. Of all the evolutionary gifts that we've received, our capacity for playfulness is probably one of the most important. Playfulness is found only in mammals. It's never found in lizards or toads or turtles. Those creatures know only fear and appetite. And we become monstrous ourselves when our human existence becomes too dominated by fear and appetite, by reactivity and acquisitiveness. Look around us, look around us at our culture and our world. So much fear, so much reactivity, cable news with commercial breaks, fear with regularly scheduled breaks for greed. So instead, this morning, we practice the antidote to such a life that cannot really be called life. We play. We become playful. We laugh and groan together. We'll spend this morning talking about, learning about, and singing about zombies. If you're a first-time visitor, I want to tell you that we don't do this every week. <laughs> but other Sundays are pretty good, too. So let's play together and let's worship together. So I have to tell you that um, in terms of picking out the parts of the service that fit with the theme of zombies, it was a little bit difficult, as you might expect, until someone told me that there is, in fact, in our hymnal, a zombie hymn. It's number 321. Let me... The, the words to it are printed as our chalice lighting, but I actually want you to open up, open up your hymnal to number 321. And we're just going to read the first stanza of it together as, um, as Brian lights our chalice. And I want to tell you about this, that this, um, this hymn, um, it's, it's not really very singable at all, which is why, which is why we're reading the words today. The, um, the music was actually composed by, I'm told, by a person who was formerly a member of this church. So um, that's interesting. But, but I want you to read it and, and think, what could this hymn possibly be about if not zombies? So won't you join with me in the first stanza of Here in the Flesh? Here in the flesh is all that we can know, all beauty, all wonder, all the power all the unearthly colors, all the glow, here in the self which withers like a flower. Spooky, huh? I think it's safe to say that we are the only church in the triangle this morning that's singing zombie jamboree, <laughs> which means we're having a lot more fun. A decade ago, in the spring of 2004, Mel Gibson, remember him, released his film, The Passion of the Christ. The film was controversial and polarizing and, and a total box office hit. After several weeks at number one at the box office, the movie that knocked it out of the number one spot was none other than a remake of George Romero's Dawn of the Dead. 
That's right, a violent, gory film about rising from the dead and consuming flesh was beaten out at the box office by a zombie movie. In the past decade or so, the popularity of zombies has only risen, no pun intended. Zombie movies have gone from cult horror classics to mainstream box office hits whose casts include movie stars like Brad Pitt. The Walking Dead, now in its fifth season, is a smash hit on television with tens of millions of viewers tuning in each week. In the humor section of the bookstore, you can pick up your own copy of the Zombie Survival Guide, and high school students who need a little bit of extra motivation with their English homework can read Pride and Prejudice and Zombies, which sets Jane Austen's classic Inside the Zombie Apocalypse. Or if you like serious literature, you'll find that it's now acceptable for critically acclaimed literary talents like MacArthur Genius Award recipient Colson Whitehead to write zombie fiction. Fitness enthusiasts can sign up for a zombie 5K in which contestants run while weaving through and being pursued by swarms of the undead. Unless you think this is all just a bunch of silliness, it was revealed last spring that the United States Department of Defense does in fact have a zombie preparedness plan just in case. So zombies are a thing. And this morning, what I want to do is spend a little bit of time exploring why zombie culture has such a wide appeal to so many in our society. But I also want to go a little bit deeper as well and do some zombie theology. I want to put zombie culture in conversation with Unitarian Universalist values and thought and find out if they have anything to say to each other. The first thing that I want to say is that zombie movies in particular and horror movies in general have a um, kind of a specific aesthetic dimension to them. They also have dimensions that are emotional and psychological and moral and political, but it's difficult for a lot of us to see beyond the aesthetic dimension. How many people here would say that they're fans of horror movies? About one in ten. About one in ten. Um, and I would guess that for many of us, the aesthetic dimension of horror movies, the gore, the screaming, the suspense, the sudden jolts, turn a lot of us off. But beyond the, beyond the aesthetics, there's a psychological dimension that has to do with fear and disgust. Those are the emotions that horror tries to evoke. But horror movies have a moral dimension as well. They are morality tales. Take a classic like The Fly or even, say, Jurassic Park. These films ask moral questions. In those two films, they ask whether our capacity for scientific knowledge exceeds our capacity for wisdom and prudence. The films are a moral warning against our own hubris or greed or obsession, those qualities that can lead to something monstrous. Zombie movies, perhaps more than any other type of horror movie, are moral critiques of the world in which we live. The very first zombie movie that uh, established kind of the very first modern zombie movie was George Romero's Night of the Living Dead. It came out in 1968 and captured a world that was tumultuous and uncertain. The film is a metaphor for the social unrest of the times, for Vietnam, the civil rights movement, the assassinations of Martin and Malcolm and Jack and Bobby, and the unraveling of the sexual, gender, racial, and economic norms of the 1950s. And so in 1968, when Night of the Living Dead came out, it was controversial for its depiction of gore, but it was also controversial because it cast a black man in a position of authority and leadership over the white actors in the film. And if you read the critiques of it, People were just as upset by you know, a daughter eating her father's entrails as they were by this African-American person calling the shots. It troubled people at the time equally. I think that's somewhat telling. George Romero said of his zombie film, 
We were the children of the 60s, angry that peace and love hadn't changed the world, and some of our anger made its way into the film, and journalists began to write about what we had done, calling it essential American cinema. I'd never thought of myself in any way as essential, nor had I even thought of myself as a filmmaker. But it's only in the years since Night of the Living Dead that I've taken myself at all seriously. The response to that film made me realize that I could inject socio-political satire into the sort of horror fictions that I loved since I was a boy, so I've continued to do that. Romero ends by saying, when I want to speak about what I perceive to be happening in the world, I open the door to my closet, ask the zombies to come out into the light, and I shoot a movie with those zombies. And when they get hungry, I feed them a producer. <laughs> Romero continued to inject social political satire into his movies. In Dawn of the Dead, the survivors of the zombie apocalypse find refuge in a shopping mall. And the movie is a commentary on consumerism and the camera shots of the hordes of zombies trying to break into the mall look exactly, exactly <laughs> like the film footage of throngs of shoppers trying to get in the door for a Black Friday sale. In Resident Evil, it is the sinister Umbrella Corporation, part pharmaceutical company, part military contractor, part media conglomerate, that causes the zombification of the population. The enemy is unchecked corporatism. In 28 Days Later, the virus that causes people to become zombies is known simply as rage. Hmm. And in the comedy, Shaun of the Dead, the recurring gag is that it's hard to be sure who's a zombie and who isn't. The lurching, groaning person stumbling through the streets at night it could be a zombie or it could be someone who just had a little bit too much to drink at the pub. The guy sitting on the sofa staring at the TV screen and drooling on himself while playing video games. Zombie or not. <laughs> zombie movies offer moral critiques of the world in which we live. Are we the victims of corporatism and consumerism? Is anger or apathy making us less than human? Zombie stories also ask us what it means to live life to its fullest. The Walking Dead comic books are each introduced with the same teaser. How many hours are in a day when you don't spend half of them watching television? How long has it been since any of us really needed something that we wanted? The world we know is gone. The world of commerce and frivolous necessity has been replaced by a world of survival and responsibility. An epidemic of apocalyptic proportions has swept the globe, causing the dead to rise and feast on the living. In a matter of months, society has crumbled. No government, no grocery stores, no mail delivery, no cable TV. In a world ruled by the dead, we are forced to finally start living. Here we find one of the most significant referring feature, recurring features in zombie literature and film. The idea of living one's own life with meaning and purpose and intention instead of mindlessly living something less than life. And so we find that the characters in zombie films don't fear dying, they fear becoming zombies. They fear that their life may be devoid of thought, devoid of choice, and spent trying to find some brains to consume. In Colson Whitehead's novel, Z Zone One, there are a minority of zombies called stragglers, who don't become aggressive cannibals, but rather return to a familiar place and spend the rest of eternity holding a pose or just repetitively doing the same thing over and over again. The protagonist in the novel, Mark, has the job of clearing out the stragglers and reports discovering a straggler in the copy room of a high-rise office building, repetitively pushing the same button on the copier over and over and over again. That's horror. So whether it's the stragglers or the zombies trying to break into the mall or the catatonic video game player or just your average run-of-the-mill zombie, zombie shuffling down the street, there is a point being made again and again about how we actually live and how we ought to live. My colleague Michael Schuler introduced me to a concept in Buddhism known as the hungry ghost. 
In Buddhism, the hungry ghost is the person whose life has given in completely to greed, jealousy, and envy. Their whole life is one of constant hunger, constant desire, but the truth is that what they crave will never be enough to satisfy them. The hungry ghost will never be full, but spends its life in the futile attempt to become. The zombie can never have enough brains. And so I want to ask you, I want to ask you, be honest with me here. Have you ever felt like you are surrounded by zombies? <laughs> Have you ever felt like you're surrounded by, by thoughtless people just going through the motions? How many of us will admit feeling that way from time to time? I admit to feeling that way. A few, a few brave souls raise their hands. I admit to feeling that way. Um, and, and don't take this wrong way, but, the wrong way, but, but I feel this way right now, in fact. Not, not you. <laughs> I actually feel this way in the fall every other year. I feel this way during election season. And you're, and you're thinking, there's a number of ways you could go with that, Tom. <laughs> but this, this year is a midterm election. We know from history and from the past four decades that voter turnout from the midterm elections never gets above 40%. That 60% of Americans eligible to vote won't bother to cast a vote this fall. Let me put that another way. We know right now that, that the, the two Senate candidates, Kay Hagan and Tom Tillis, are locked in a very close race for the United States Senate. And that whoever winds up winning, the results will be that almost exactly one voter out of five voted for Hagan that almost exactly one voter out of five voted for Tillis, and three voters out of five didn't even bother to show up. One out of five will vote for one candidate, one out of five will vote for the other, and three out of five won't vote. Do you ever feel like you're surrounded by zombies? <laughs> Anti-populism. Anti-populism is this major recurring theme within zombie entertainment and it's a theme that is, that is problematic. Take, for instance, my favorite example of this, Jess Walters' zombie short story entitled Don't Eat Cat. Don't Eat Cat is about a zombie workplace retraining program offered by Starbucks. <laughs> the first step is the cat test. The zombie being retrained must have the self-control to be in a room with a cat without trying to eat the cat. <laughs> the second step in the zombie retraining program is how to work the cappuccino machine. <laughs> it doesn't feel quite right to laugh at this, does it? I mean, I mean, we can all, from time to time, feel like we're surrounded by mindless zombies that group of other people, that socioeconomic class, that generation, those people who vote for that political party, the people who go to that church, the people who go to that church, they're just a bunch of conformists or a bunch of sheep or, or a bunch of mindless zombies. I think the best in our Unitarian Universalist religion calls us to resist such thinking. It calls on us to humanize the other, to sympathize, to understand, to identify with one another. We call that the inherent worth and dignity of every person. And I actually think there's two features of zombie entertainment that help us to counter such anti-populism. The first thing is that the zombies are never the bad guys. In the, uh, in the media, nobody chooses to be a zombie. Zombies are never really at fault. Forgive them, for they know not what they do. The other thing we find is that in zombie movies, the non-zombies always are possible, are always, are always capable of being a lot scarier than the zombies. The survivors, it turns out, don't exactly behave like the paragons of human virtue. Far from it. And we ought to remember this whenever there is a temptation to think of the other as subhuman. 
What should we take away from this morning? What should we take away besides the fact that your new minister has spent a frightening amount of time watching zombie movies and reading about and thinking about zombies? Here are three takeaways that I invite you to take away with you. The first thing I want you to take away is that parts of our culture that are unfamiliar to you or even off-putting can be more than just mindless fun. I'm not saying that you should go out and watch a horror movie. The Walking Dead isn't for everybody, even if it is for tens of millions of Americans each week. And so I, what I don't want is I don't want for anyone here who is squeamish to go out and get frightened and have nightmares and come back and blame me. <laughs> Just please don't dismiss culture that doesn't do it for you or doesn't make sense to you. The second thing I want you to take away is to challenge your thinking about the masses. It is somewhat natural to feel from time to time like we are just surrounded by mindless zombies. But this way of thinking is actually kind of problematic. It leads into ways of being in the world that aren't that virtuous or healthy. The third thing that I want to, you to take away this morning is a passionate commitment and desire to live what is truly life. We've seen this morning that fear and hate and discrimination and consumerism and corporatism and rage can lead us to act in ways that are less than fully human. And so I implore you to rejoin the living to say yes to life. And in thinking about all of the texts that I could choose about saying yes to life, one text in particular caught my mind, caught my eye. And so I'd like to invite our worship associate, Brian, to come up and to lead us all uh, in a reading from Henry, Henry David Thoreau. Many people wonder why Henry David Thoreau exiled himself in the woods at Walden Pond for more than two years. Our responsive reading suggests that it may have been to escape the zombies, or that Thoreau may have been a zombie himself. Please open your hymnals to a responsive reading number 660 and join with me in, uh, I'll read the plain text, and if you would please respond with the italicized portion. Why should we live in a hurry and waste of life? We are determined to be starved before we are hungry. I wish to live deliberately, to front only the essential facts of life. I wish to learn what life has to teach, and not on account of the discovery that I have not lived. I do not wish to live what is not life. Living is so dear. Live deep and suck out all the marrow of life. <laughs> if it proves to be mean, then to get the whole and genuine meanness of it and publish its meanness to the world. 